Thank you for the introduction. I'm Inga Rashi, and I will be serving as moderator. This is the first time in three years that I am um, here for the face-to-face uh, -face event at Arts Council Forum. As um, mentioned earlier, um, cities um, are a topic um, th that we are interested in. Last time, we looked at Hong Kong's West Kulon um, discussion with um, Paul Tamsan and also Tokyo's Takanawa Gateway um, um, cultural complex. So last time we talked about Tokyo and Hong Kong. And today uh, we continue to focus on cities. And so we will be looking at how cities are involved in international festi cultural festivals. And both of our, our guest speakers today um, are working actively inside um, of their own mother countries and also working internationally as well. So the two guest speakers are going beyond borders, really um, bringing um, art to various audiences. And we look forward to a discussion about that in, in the second half. But I'd first like to um, ask Yi Sukyun san uh, for her presentation. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for very meaningful and um, a significant invitation from uh, Arts Council Tokyo. And uh, all the people here, um, I would like to also thank you for making the time on a Sunday afternoon uh, in a quite sunny day. So I do appreciate your attending uh, this talk. I will talk a little bit about um, what I did as a senior curator at Tate Modern for uh, a bit more than 10 years. And then um, certain sort of a, a project I did um, uh, in that context, but also uh, as sort of different type of uh, activities as a curator. And um, I would like to just say how the cultures and different cultures and how they interconnect and exchange have really been a focus of my curatorial practice will be really the sort of uh, main topic of today's. Um, and um, I would also like to just uh, emphasize how important it is to talk about art and culture in a global context rather than just in a national or sort of region-based ways. It's really important for understanding each other and ultimately to live together in our own differences. Tate Modern is in London, which is a very international city. And Tate Modern's visitors are almost half of them are international visitors. So it's very important for us to understand who really are coming to our museum and how we can really serve very different sort of perspectives in a more coherent and um, democratic way. And as you probably are aware, uh, most of Tate Modern's spaces, about 70% is a free admission space. You need to pay for certain exhibitions, which are like more temporary um, loan-in exhibitions. But for most collection displays and other program, it's very important to have free admission so that people um, of all sort of walks of life can come and enjoy art from across the world. And Tate Modern was built in 2000 as an international art museum. And before that, Tate Gallery existed for almost 100 years as British and International Art Museum, but it was mostly historic rather than contemporary. And with a lot of uh, efforts in contemporary art field, including the rising sort of popularity of 
British young British artist YBA movement. It became very um, fundamental to have a contemporary art museum rather than just exhibition venues. Because before then, they were very small public venues, but not an art museum with big collection. So collection building has always been very important for Tate Modern, um, for all of Tate, because Tate has Tate Britain, Tate Modern, Tate Liverpool, and St. Ives in Cornwall. So some rural areas, but also um, sort of holiday places, and north of England, which is more industrial and less sort of uh, affluent place. And I'd like to talk just a few examples of uh, what I did as a curator to contribute to that vision. This is a scene from a view from Tokyo display. And it started with 1970 Tokyo Biennale, which happened in Tokyo. Actually, there was a biennial, and there was a hugely um, ambitious international exhibition happening in Tokyo. And um, some scholars, international and uh, Japanese, have been doing some research about Tokyo Biennale and um, what kind of artists were shown there. And a lot of artists from the US and Europe participated. And we realized that at Tate Modern that we actually have a lot of those artists in the collection. So rather than showing these artists in the more conventional way, um, we decided to have Tokyo Biennale 1970 as one particular point of view. So we called it a view from Tokyo. And then as you can see, you can see these panels made of wood by um, Koshimizu Susumu, and also uh, one on the floor by Liu Fan, and both very active members of Japan's um, sort of minimal art movement, Monoha. And you can see Jiro Takamatsu at the back also, and in the midst of these things were also um, artists from Arte Povera, from Italy, and some British artists like Barry Flanagan, and there were also Hans, uh, Hans, um, other artists from Europe and um, US at the time. And we wanted to just show how the global turn didn't really happen overnight in the 90s or 2000s, but continuously sort of happening in previous generations of artists as well. And Namjoon Pek was the, one of the sort of shows I curated at Tate Modern that also looked at transnational connections as a main theme. And Namjoon Pek was born in South Korea, Korea during the colonial time and then uh, studied at the Tokyo University, um, aesthetics rather than fine art, and musicology. And he moved to uh, then West Germany to study experimental music with uh, Schoenberg and that type of legacies. And there he sort of met many experimental artists and musicians and moved to New York uh, in the mid 60s and again made quite a sort of community of artists working in experimental art and using technology as his own sort of artistic language as well. But he's largely known as the pioneer of video art in art history, but I didn't want to use that um, expression, but really wanted to emphasize what's very interesting about his practice was this transnational connections. How born in one place, working in another, and moving to live and work in different continents really informed his practice as a very global one. And why he was he interested in technology, satellite, and these things? Um, perhaps there are other ways of understanding his practice rather than just through video as a medium. So I started the show with this uh, very well-known work, um, TV Buddha from 1974. And as you can see at the back, um, 
there's TV garden also. And these were the kind of things I wanted to say throughout the show, how the idea of nature as an East Asian born artist and how the sort of belief system like Buddhism, which is very different from Christianity or um, Islamic sort of thinking that sort of informs this understanding of totality in art, but also how the upcoming sort of civilizations, achievement like technology um, can deal with these old and traditional ideas. And throughout the show, I also um, wanted to sort of make connections with people like Joseph Boyce and John Cage and other artists who participated with him, like um, Charlotte Moorman, the cellist, who was a real sort of life partner in the way that uh, their work was really interconnected through the medium, but also their different cultures. And also um, another show, recent exhibition I curated was A Year in Art, Australia, 1992. 1992 was the year when the Australian uh, legal system acknowledged that uh, the land, when they arrived from Britain as a British empire uh, 250 years ago, the land was actually uh, occupied by some people. That was first, I mean, acknowledged for the first time in 1992. Before then, the sort of legal definition of the land was terra nullius, the, the land belonging to nobody. So they didn't really see indigenous people, the first people of Australia, as the owners of their land. And that sort of makes it easier for sort of empire to colonize the land without actually regarding those people living there as a real occupant. They were actually regarded as flora and fauna, like, like animals and botanical plants. So that, that was a very important year for indigenous people to really deal with the colonial history. So when Tate was um, given an opportunity to acquire Australian art, we made a collective decision to look at indigenous art, what is called Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's art, more, um, with more focus on those practice, like the bark painting on the left, rather than seeing that as like the artifact maybe going to British Museum, we wanted to really show these are works by contemporary artists who may have not had um, education which is a formal in art schools, but still continuing their sort of very long history of making forms and colors on these new surfaces like bark, canvas, and these things. And another exhibition uh, based on the sort of new acquisition for the collection was Richard Bell's Aboriginal Embassy. This work started uh, in homage of an activism called Aboriginal Embassy, which started in the 70s in Canberra, the capital of Australia. And some just um, Aboriginal sort of activists started to have an umbrella and little tent and these things to just uh, state we are here, we exist, and we need to be acknowledged as the owners of the land and all these things. And Richard Bell was actually activist first. He didn't study art formally, but he started as an artist with the experience of activism, and it became the real sort of um, background and source for his artistic practice. So when he made this Aboriginal embassy a few years ago, and this has been shown in many different places outside and inside Australia, and his sort of way of activating that venue. The tent doesn't mean anything really, but when it's activated like this in a place as a site for a venue for discussion, debate, 
then it becomes something else. So that actual sort of content of the artwork is not the tent, but the discussion itself. So it gets archived each time it's activated. So it's a growing work. So when we talk about like the changing nature of um, art, artworks beyond being objects, this is one of those sort of examples that also has social kind of element aspect within it. Um, the next one I'll talk about is the 14th Gwangju Biennale, which happened in, uh, from April to July this year in Gwangju, South Korea. And I took the title from Lao Zi's Tao Te Ching. It's a very ancient text. It's almost like Plato or like that time, <laughs> 300 BC, um, possibly, and probably quite collective writing, changed over time and we, we see that as like a way of understanding the world and how to live in the world that is quite political. And soft and weak like water is just one tiny sort of four letter kind of thing uh, from Tao Te Ching. Uh, in, in Korean, you call it Yu Yag Osu. So like water, you need to be soft and weak, but it actually um, sort of tries to be kind of the expression of um, something very seemingly in, intangible and really insignificant, but that can change very hard and strong, powerful things. And as a sort of a, uh, someone born in South Korea and educated in Eastern philosophy and beliefs, I was kind of thinking during the lockdown, because we had a lot of time to think about different things, um, where, I, where my thoughts actually came from and where my sort of uh, particular lived experience might go from here. And um, I was very interested in like these ancient texts, but not just um, lousy type things, but also I was reading Virginia Woolf and other sort of the classics for me as a person who were educated in both Eastern and Western ways. And I think that was kind of a good starting point for me to see the world from my point of view, but not as a self-centered way, but just acknowledging this is a universal way. There are always different ways to see the world. And let's just be very clear about just how small and subjective my view may be, but maybe it's an interesting way to see a lot of different views, very many, several different diverse views. And I invited uh, 79 artists into sort of four themes. One theme was Luminous Halo from Virginia Woolf. <laughs> and um, this section had a lot of um, personal um, sort of perseverance about something difficult, something difficult, something ch sort of challenging. And as you can see here, one was uh, Om Jung Sun, Korean artist working with blind or visually impaired children. And she makes uh, these sort of little marquee uh, type things about elephants, because there is a saying, I'm sure you know also, uh, about blind people touching elephants and coming up with what really elephant looks like. And they think some think it looks like a tree trunk if you touch the sort of legs. But if you touch uh, their nose, they may say it, it's like a snake. And then they may say something else when they touch the ears or body. So it's about the impossibility of l understanding the total, the entirety of certain things and very limited sort of views we have when we actually understand certain things. So it had a quite a philosophical meaning, but also a very practical way of making blind children to experience the world like elephants in a different way. And she makes these huge sculptures with very um, everyday sort of medium of paper and little sort of structures to make those makis into larger sculptures. And Christine Sun Kim, American artist based in LA, is a deaf artist, but working with sound. 
and she was visualizing this sort of um, languages and sort of sounds into certain sort of forms, visual art forms. And here you can see sign language, sort of the hand doing sign language, American sign language, into sort of talking about one, two, three, four in different sort of ways of one bottle, one person, that type of thing on the sort of, uh, as a projected images on the floor. And another subsection was ancestral voices. I wanted to really s sort of see how artists from very different cultures were responding to their traditions and ancestral knowledge. And as you can see here, Tarek Atui, artist working with sound, um, worked with a uh, traditional master of um, instrument in Korea. So he makes these instruments like the drums and little things. And Tarek Atui worked with this Korean master to make new instrument and sort of controlled and uh, made sort of uh, ways to make own sound and li as little kinetic sort of sculptures uh, in Gwangju as a new work. And that was largely for children's workshop to learn about the instrument, but also sound. And in the middle, you can see Matao Collective, uh, four women, Maori women from New Zealand. And again, the sort of knowledge Maori people have, especially in women's sort of artistic field, like weaving in certain ways. And they just made this fantastic inf installation of like um, the Thai material for trucks. When you tie just stuff onto the truck, they have just very uh, everyday kind of um, strips of like uh, plastic and, and just these things, um, ordinary things, but weaved in the space in the way that was Maori weaving technique. And Edgar Kalel, uh, someone, I mean, indigenous artist from Guatemala, also um, made works in homage of his ancestors because he understands his being itself is really the result of all this ancestral time and knowledge. And all his works is like little fruit, actual live fruit, which we had to change over time. Um, they were really the offerings for the ancestors in the way that they are used in his community. And also the drawing was, again, about uh, sort of his um, grandmother's little hut. And transient sovereignty looked at the sort of uh, people's own body as the site for resistance. Any, any type of like colonial sort of power can be beyond politics and about the body, especially the queer body or the body of the diseased. And I was sort of working with Chang Jia, Korean feminist artist, and Guadalupe Maravilla, also looking at the disease as a kind of impression of um, internalized um, trauma. And planetary times as more of an ecological sort of um, concerns coming to contemporary artists like the indigenous artist from Australia, Judy Watson, and also artists from Singapore, um, Robert Zauron, who looking at the sort of how nature still exists in a very, very urban place like Singapore. And um, Yuko, I mean, Mori Yuko was one of the artists I invited, and that really was the first sort of encounter I had uh, properly with um, artist Mori, and she uh, made a sort of reinterpretation of her existing work, I.O., input and output, in this particular space as a site-specific installation, which responded to this, sort of this area's anti-colonial history. So as a Japanese artist, challenge was really to acknowledge her own history in relation to the histories of the colonized. And in Asia, it's, it's a very important, but also very um, difficult topic to address. And she did it in a very delicate and thoughtful way. And some parts of this 
inquiry will appear in her Japan Pavilion work next year in Venice as well. And that's how we met and became the sort of this um, duo for the Japan Pavilion next year in Venice. And Doki Jordan, also from uh, Europe, but with connection with Korea as a sort of a baby adopted by German parents. And looking at these different ways of understanding whole cosmology through very te technology-based um, installation. I will just finish with something um, that really sort of sums up what I'm interested as a museum director now. Um, it's about how to make museums and galleries as more of a civic space. So this was the one I was involved at Tate Modern for Turbine Hall, the big area when you enter the, the, the museum. And it was actually a um, reinterpretation or of enactment by Gutai artists, the post-war Japanese artistic group uh, based in Osaka and Kansai area. And um, Yoshihara Jiro in the 50s actually said uh, something like, you know, art can be everywhere and also artistic expression can be in any ways. And one thing he said was uh, this project in the park in Osaka. And he said, please draw freely. And then children and other people could really draw on this canvas provided by the artist. And we wanted to do provide a floor of the turbine hall as that type of canvas and invited artist, the younger um, Japanese artist Arakawa A, based in New York, to reinterpret it and to reenact these things. So I just wanted to say, looking back history in our, our, our art, but also thinking about where we are in the world, it's really important to understand our own positions in a very specific um, way, but also making sure that we appreciate the larger context and how sort of the connectedness itself is really sometimes um, informing our decisions in artistic but also cultural life and just a more larger sort of questions about social context of art. So thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. And the next presenter is uh, Hashimoto san. Hello, everyone. I'm Yusuke Hashimoto. And thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you today. So I'd like to talk from a performing arts perspective in my presentation. And first of all, you know, um, because I have been active um, long in Kyoto. Maybe many of you may not know me very well. Right now, I'm working in Berlin. I'd like to give you a brief um, history of where I come from. So I went to Kyoto to um, enter into university, and then I started getting into acting. Back then in university, there was um, academic studies and then there was performing arts, but there was no educational system that tied the artistic uh, performances with the academic research. And so um, during my days at university, I was working on um, trying to connect them. And so after graduating from university, I wanted to you know, think of how I could still be with the performing arts. Um, I was not able to find any outlet that allowed me to do so. I, so I started my own arts management office and um, worked um, for performing arts. Now, one uh, time, um, there was um, 
no opportunity for me in Kyoto, even if I wanted to disseminate information about all of the performing arts um, th uh, that are going on inside of Japan. I felt the need for an international venue. And that's how um, I started the Kyoto um, experiment, which is um, an international um, festival. Um, so I started this totally independently. I had a very weak financial um, you know, um, base, and I was wondering what to do. And then Kyoto City um, was actually going to be renovating the Kyoto Art Center, which is um, a very traditional building. And there was discussion on how to renovate that art center. And so I and my friends got together and said that, you know, um, we should be establishing a committee called the um, Arts um, Consideration Committee 2020. We came up with our own set of recommendations and we um, lobbied the Kyoto City to incorporate some of our ideas into their plan for renovation. And they said, you know, if you're going to say all those things, why don't you start working to make that happen? And so that's how I joined Rome Theatre Kyoto and um, started working with them. And that's why one of the main venues of the Kyoto Experiment is Rome Theatre Kyoto. And so now our uh, financial base has started to um, stabilize after that. So I worked on the Kyoto Experiment. I also worked for Roaming Theatre Kyoto. And I thought of a lot of different things. If you look at the main theaters and festivals, uh, many of these events are led by elderly men. And they have been in those leadership positions for a long time, which is kind of weird. And so I felt that we should have more liquidity in the people that manage. And I decided that I would quit after 10 years. So three years before that 10 years was up, I said that when my 10th year comes, I'm going to be quitting what I'm currently doing. And so fortunately, I was able to find good successors. And so from 2020, the new members are taking the helm to lead the events. Uh, unfortunately, there was no one who joined me in um, leaving at the 10th year mark, so I was the only one who left after 10 years. Now, 2019 is the year when the IG Triennale um, took place. And after having done my work at um, Kyoto Experiment, I was um, committed to continue working for Rome Theatre Kyoto, but I did want some time to settle and study. And that's why I applied for the cultural agency's um, um, overseas training session. So um, I had prepared the application documents in 2019. IG Triennale started in August 2019, and then we had the um, non-freedom expression um, incident. And then I decided to change um, the um, place I wanted to get my tr uh, training. It, New York. And that's why um, I found that through the IG Triennale that there's actually um, a lot of restrictions around art and expression. And also because of the incident that happened at the IG Triennale, some of the subsidies were cancelled. And so I was one of the people who objected to that. But um, society um, had very cold eyes towards us artists. And I looked up at the research, and I found that many people who live in Japan do understand that freedom of expression is a basic human right. On the other hand, if artists want to express themselves freely, people in Japan believe that they should not be um, using government subsidies. If you want to um, express something that you feel um, you should express, then why don't you use your own money to do that? I was very shocked to understand how that was uh, people in society thought. You know, um, Romsi the Kyoto and Kyoto Experiment uh, both have subsidies and grants from the cultural agencies. So public money was being used and was necessary to keep art going. I thought that was the norm. But then I was reminded how it's only the artist world who thinks that way. Um, I had kind of suspected that may be what people in general are thinking, but the polls really um, told us that people in general did not feel like we were feeling in the art world. In the United States, we see a lot of experimental um, projects going on. The way that they do museums and other organizations are based on 
private donations. And so I really wanted to learn how they do fundraising in the United States. So I rewrote my application documents to the cultural agency. And from March 2021 to March 2022, I was able to go to New York to study. Now, back there, I talked to the people who were doing uh, fundraising for the theaters and also performing events. Um, I did interviews with them. And then after coming back, I put together a book saying, who is supporting art? supporting the arts. So um, please do buy that book on Amazon. But the uh, cultural agency's um, training um, in the later stages, I just got a call uh, saying, when are you going to come back from New York? When is your time in um, you know, New York ending? Do you have to come back to Japan? And I said, what's going on? And that person said, uh, do you want to come to Berlin to work? Uh, work? And that's how my bo current boss, the independent director of the um, Berlin uh, Festspiele, um, called me. And so since uh, September 2022, um, I'm working for the Berlin uh, Festspiele. And so what I wanted to talk about is meet people before art. That was the document uh, last year documenter, meet people before art. Uh, no, make friends before art. Um, um. So the Berliner Festspiele is being organized um, by uh, these organizations, which is the Kulturveranstaltungen des Bundes in Berlin. This is like a, a public foundation. This is um, um, actually owned 100 percent by the German government. And um, what this organization does is it operates the um, Berliner Festspiele and also uh, the Gropiusbau, which is a, a museum, and also the Haus der Kulturen der Welt. So these are the three organizations that are run by KBB. On the far left, you can see the Berliner Festspiele uh, building, and that's the theater. And the fourth uh, window from the right, you can see that half open window. That's the office where I work. And then a, a picture in the middle shows you the Gropius Bau. The far right is the um, HKW, the um, Haus der Kultur und der Welt. So Berliner Festspiele um, is known as the Berlin um, International Art Festival in Japan. It has a very complex history and um, makeup. There have been five festivals and two uh, cultural organizations um, working under the Berliner Festspiele. And the five festivals are the Jazz Fest and, and the Mars Music. Um, this is a contemporary fest festival. Music Fest Berlin works with the um, German uh, Philharmonic Orchestra. And then Theater Treffen, this is in the German speaking world. Um, out of all of the uh, performances that were done in the German-speaking world, seven um, judges um, screened them. And then for two weeks in uh, May, the really outstanding um, 10 works um, in the German-speaking world from the previous year are um, shown over the course of two weeks. And then Treffen Junger Scene is for young artists from 11 to 20 years old. And this is like a contest. So this has uh, um, the theater, uh, music, dance, and literature. And Grob Bispau and Haus Berliner uh, um, work together. And then you see performing arts season in the middle here. Now, it's, it is a new camp um, program from October 2023. And this is a season that I myself am involved in. You can see that the festivals usually run from March to November, and the main venue is Haus der Berliner Festspiele. So that means from November up to March, the theaters are quite empty. And so that's the time when we run the performing arts season to make use of those venues. And this is the front side of the building that you saw beforehand. And this is the uh, main venue for the Berliner Festspiele. In 1963, uh, this building was built. 
it used to be called the Fly and Folks uh, Theater, uh, meaning Free Citizen Theater. Uh, Bonneman was the art architect for this building. And this is what Gropius Bell looks like uh, when you see it front to front. And you see these logos again. Originally, this organization was called the Berliner Festival, um, the Berlin Art Week, and it started in uh, 1951. And first time, UK, US, and France um, provided funding for this festival. So what this means is that at the time of the Cold War, um, in West Berlin, the capitalist countries wanted to appeal how free the art expression is in the Western world. This was very politically motivated. And so in Berlin um, Arts Week, um, classical music was the main. Um, and then from 1964, there was experimental music going on. That went on to Mertz music. And then in the same year, 1964, Jazz Fest also started. Now, Jazz Fest in particular is um, representative of U.S. music, and it's embodying the free music um, of um, the United States. So um, they did radio um, uh, broadcasting so that even people living in East Berlin could listen to that music. And this was um, trying to motivate people to move from East Berlin to West Berlin. But now that the Cold War is over, and after Germany unified, what happened? So in 2001, Haus der Berliner Festspiele was unified into Berliner Festspiele. And it's a festival organization with its own dedicated theater to perform in. In the same year, Gropius Bau also became part of Berliner Festspiele. So the organization evolved, um, which is kind of representative of the way that um, Germany um, became more a unified country. Now, um, from February, uh, where we got this new logo type, before February of this year, we used to use these kinds of logos. In 2014, when uh, Arts Council Tokyo did a um, symposium, I think um, Thomas Oberinger, who was the um, artistic director for Berliner Fischbiele, um came over to talk. If you look at the website in his time, that's the logo type. These are the logo types that you would have seen. And like I said, there's a lot of history where different organizations and festivals, um, with e each having their own history, came together. So respecting that history, we let, let um, all of the festivals use their own uh, preferred um, logos. And the way that these uh, festivals operated is that they would have their own artistic director, they would have their own producer, they would have their communication team, and this was by festival. So even though they belonged to the same organization, there were totally different teams working on different festivals. So the new um, artistic director, Matthias Pes, um, first thought of what he would like to do and said, Bruno Feschwiller should become more unified. And the members from each team should be collaborating and working together with each other. That was the first thing he put in his new five-year plan. And this, the unified um, logo font is actually um, symbolic of that um, wish. So. Um, among working together um, includes inviting um, staff members from outside of Germany. I've never worked in Germany before. I could not speak German, but I was um, given the job um, as part of the um, international staff. So it took me a long time to go through the organizational history, but now let me go into the main topic. Sorry about that long part. So um, I have a comparison between Kyoto, Berlin, and uh, Tokyo. Uh, and Kyoto city is 827.83 square kilometers. 
Berlin is 891.85 square meters. And Kyoto is about the same size as Berlin. So actually, um, Kyoto is a city inside of Kyoto Prefecture. But um, to make it easier for comparison, I just compared Kyoto City with Berlin. Now, how big is Tokyo? What do you think? Well, if you look at the 23 wards of Tokyo, it's 627.53 square kilometers. It's actually smaller than Kyoto City or Berlin. So Tokyo is really small. How many people live in this small space? Do you know? In Kyoto City, we have 1.38 um, um, million people. Berlin um, has uh, 3.5 million. Tokyo has 9.7 million uh, people. This is impressive. Wow. Now, I work in the theater. So I uh, was intrigued to know what is the number of theaters in this city. Uh, according to my own research, uh, Kyoto City has around 210 theaters. This includes small um, um, venues um, playing live music and concert halls as well. If you look at the Berlin city, um, they have 150 theaters and 250 concert venues. So in total, they have approximately 400. Tokyo's website says there are 1,244 such venues. So theaters should probably be compared by the number of seats available. But you see, it looked like it would take me a long time to um, check the number of seats. So I just settled for the number of theaters. So what do I want to say with that? Uh, I'm still um, not um, fully sure myself. But if you just look at the number of theaters, you can see that the um, number of um, theaters um, per um, capita is approximately the same between the cities. Now let me compare um, um, Tokyo um, with other places. Well, in Tokyo, um, it's a big topic whether to cut down the trees or not. I compared the parks also. So in Kyoto City, there are 950 parks. Berlin has 2,500 parks. Tokyo, 23 world, 4,600 plus parks. And so per capita, Kyoto has 4.37 square meters of park space. Uh, Berlin has 18.919 um, square meters. Uh, for Tokyo, there's only 2.95 square meters of park space or greenery space per person. So in Berlin and Kyoto, in addition to the park parks, there's a lot of greenery around. Northern part of Kyoto is almost in the mountains. And so besides um, parks, we have um, the mountainside. In Berlin, there's a lot of greenery besides what's in the parks. So that was a comparison of the three cities. And recently, you know, working away from Tokyo and working in Berlin, uh, I'd like to move on to the topic of shift change, which is also the topic of today's forum. First of all, when we look at the um, labor environment, uh, it's changing in the art world as well with mobile work, flex time, digitalization. Um, that's all happening in Japan as well. Now, when working in Berlin, uh, what left a strong impression on me is that uh, people are starting to have diversity in the way that people work, in addition to the expression. And, and in the programs, um, diversity is a key word. That holds true for Tokyo and anywhere in Japan as well. But we also need diversity in the way that people work. And that's what's being actively said in Berlin. So in the um, House of um, Cultural World, there are staff members who do not speak German. And the KBB um, organization from this autumn started providing German language lessons for these staff members. And so as part of their work, um, they um, get to enroll in these language sessions. So there's a, a grouping, uh, working group for anti-discrimination. So the organization officially has a working group for anti-discrimination. So instead of a top-down approach where the managers will tell you um, not to discriminate other people, people in the working level are discussing and thinking 
what kind of a workplace do we need, and um, we can invite in experts. And these discussions are done as part of each person's own work. Another point I'd like to mention is generation change. Uh, in Europe, we are starting to see a turnover in the generation in the performing arts in uh, Europe. Well, I really feel that people are becoming more mobile across borders. In Germany this spring, Soma Chiaki became um, the director for the um, International Festival, Manchester International Festival. Program director was, is a person from Singapore and who worked in um, Hong Kong, um, Ki Hong. And it, in Norway, um, in the city of Bergen, again, an international performing arts um, theater artistic director was also from Singapore. And then uh, Festival Doton, uh, uh, the Autumn uh, Paris, from three years ago, an Italian person is heading that festival. And then in the Lyon uh, Dance uh, Biennale, um, that's headed by a person from Portugal. So there's a lot of mobility inside of Europe. And if you look at the um, German uh, fest, um, director, um, that person has gone to Montreal. I'm in my 40s, and people under 40 are really um, having a generation change. And, and as they, they, we change to the new generation, they're also becoming more mobile and international. So they're starting to. Um, travel uh, across geographies as well. And then the third part is sustainability. Now, if you just focus on that word sustainability, um, there's a lot of attention in Japan right now. When people talk about sustainability, however, they mostly mean environmental burdens. But uh, in Japan, it's becoming a hard topic, um, labor burden, especially people in the arts sector uh, being exploited um, um, so artists um, just um, support the work through passion only, not getting enough compensation. They get burnout. And the same thing is happening in um, Europe as well. I hear it um, and I see that a lot. Um, the third point which I'd like to stress today is talent burden, uh, which is a word that I coined for talent burden. I think we also need to think of sustainability here. We need to lessen the burden that we put on people's talents. In performing arts festivals, in one festival, or um, in um, one festival director um, tends to um, really monopolize the really um, high profile uh, performers. And then different festivals will be competing for that same artist. And then they will be concentrating their commissions to that artist. The artist himself or herself um, really gets burnout. Um, the talent becomes depleted. And we see that burnout a lot in the past 20 years to 30 years. And so because the work is super concentrated on a handful of artists, that artist is um, will make it misunderstand uh, mis some things that they be because um, they are so sought after. People will try to pamper them, and then they um, will expect special treatment. And then these artists are going to create problems, sexual harassment or power harassment. So there's a negative side um, to the artist as well as the people around that artist. And so certain festivals and theaters trying to uh, monopolize um, certain artists only. We should also lessen that burden there. And we should really share the talent more broadly. And if we do not do that, the sustainability of the performing arts world is not going to hold. And that's a recent discussion that's happening. And that's the third aspect of shift change. And I, this is the last topic I'd like to present. As a personal challenge, in the Haus der Berliner Festspiele, which is the theater that I work in, this is about this. I, I'm struggling about the scale of the performances that go there. If the, in the picture that you saw earlier, 
Well, that um, theater has 1,000 seats, and there's a lot of space inside the theater. And if you look at Tokyo, it's almost like the Tokyo um, Arts um, Center Playhouse, and it's a really big place. And when we try to select the works that will be performed there, it mostly ends up being works from Europe. But I've been working in Kyoto for 25 years. I um, did know European works as well, but I was more familiar with J Japanese and Asian works. And m my knowledge is uh, of those Japanese and Asian works is what got me to work to Berlin. And so I want to introduce more Asian and, and Japanese works. And because the theater is too big, uh, we're not able to put those um, performances on. So that's how I got to think about um, the capital that supports the production. The scale of the production um, really has to do with the mechanism of how uh, that production is done. In Japan, major productions um, really rely on how well that um, the rights owner um, uh, or the work is, or if you have major actors. Only if you have a well-known actor um, playing uh, in the performing in the play, uh, only then can you get an audience big enough to fill the place. And then the producers, etc., have a lot of power. And that's one thing that I like to point out. So, why is the mechanism not working in Japan? There's one thing that came to mind. In Japan, um, there's not enough places or sites where we can accumulate capital that um, makes for a viable production. That could be um, economical, spatial, and then um, knowledge, and also personnel. And also the intellectual capital and the personnel capital. We do not have enough places where we can nurture them. In Japan, I'd like to say there's not um, enough structure for theaters. There are lots of venues, but do those theaters accumulate their know-how, etc.? No, in most places, they're just infrastructure. Uh, and they just um, have different plays come in and go out. It's almost like just a rent-out space. And that's why the intellectual capital and human capital is not being accumulated. So. This is something that I felt when I was working at Rome Theatre Kyoto. And to um, go even further, even if you have a theatre, education to support um, the human capital. Do we have that education in Japan? Well, actually, looking back at my own um, history, personal history, um, that's um, a point that really um, I feel. As um, Sukyun-san said earlier, in order to generate something new, you really need to face the past as well and reflect on the history as well. And so academic um, research and studies are really important. But when I was um, in the performing arts in Kyoto, people were like, you know, just move your hands instead of your mouth. And, and people would send me out to buy um, lunch boxes and then and try to get a venue for parties, after parties. And then people who, who could do that were called high performers. And so we totally had nothing to do with academic research. And that's how I accumulated my own experience. So when I'm working in Berlin right now, I feel there's a big gap in what we want to do and what my own experience um, has. So what should we do about education? Well, Arts Council Tokyo has capacity building training sessions, which I think is great. But the Japanese performing arts environment, is society really wanting intellectual capital in the first place? We should be a little skeptical about that. Now, the other day, um, the Diet passed a law mandating 
um, educational organizations to submit the midterm plan, etc. And so Japan is really placing low importance on um, the um, educational piece. And we really do not see what is Japan's vision for the future. Well, we sort of see the vision, but that's for a handful of powerful people to really change things that are in a way that suits them and is easier for them to manage. And last but not least, I'd like to come back to this message. When you think about challenges in art and when you do various initiatives for those challenges, the fundamental problem is in the society. And so we first need to get political before we can focus on art. I'm not suggesting that we should go into political activity, but at least everyone should have their own political and personal opinions, and they should be acting on and that belief through voting. People often say that people who are artists or are in art, their art does not directly um, touch on politics. But in, indirectly, we can appeal to the public about political belief through art. Uh, I'm perfectly OK with that being a form of expression. But it doesn't matter if you are an artist or um, are in the art world. I think we as citizens, first and foremost, need to show our beliefs. And we need to go out there in town, really talk to the people who actually have problems firsthand, and then discuss what kind of a society do we want to realize. So before we meet art, we should meet people firsthand. And, and with that, I'd like to, um, no, uh, you know, I, I said pride, but I, and that was a mix between slide and presentation, sorry. So um, with that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you very much, Hashimoto-san. So we have heard the two presentations. And we would like to move on to the discussion session. Uh, we'd like to set the stage, so if you can please wait a short moment. So thank you very much for the two presentations. I have been given a list of questions for this discussion, but um, first, I'd like to pose some questions concerning the presentations that we've just heard. Um, first, uh, Dr. Lee Suk-kyung. So um, you, are, you are the director of Whitworth now. Um, I think you have been appointed, appointed anew. And in the presentation, I believe, since you didn't have time, you may have cut uh, this out. But so since you are now at this uh, new place. Um, if you have any thoughts about what you would like to do there, if you can add something on that point. Uh, I think it's really, uh, for me, like um, Hashimoto Tsang said, personal project. <laughs> um, my challenge and my ambition really about that um, museum is how to realize um, what's important in art and make it more relevant to the people who visit. And um, art is, in a way, quite an exclusive field with artists and curators. When you think about very elite sort of art world internationally, it's even smaller kind of thing. But um, when you actually think about the people who come to these museums and small public venues, um, it's really important to think about what kind of experience they have. So I don't want to really teach people about art in these museums, and especially at the Whitworth, which has a very long history, about like about 100 years of history of collecting art that may not be very fine art, such as textiles and wallpaper, and also uh, always making that uh, principle of making the exhibition admission ch charge free. And anyone can come in, actually, to use the toilet, to use the shop cafe, but also happen to see some art. I like that. And I really wanted to make that um, type of venue to be absolutely very um, 
special and also very high uh, quality so art venue as well. It doesn't have to be either popular or elite, but somewhere in between with very good art, but very accessible and open. So in a way, my vision for the Whitworth is really about making sure these venues exist and um, to be sustainable and with the right kind of way of curating, but also valuing that experience an art venue can offer. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So, um, Manchester, I, I have visited uh, the place once. Um, in the surrounding, um, you have the University of Manchester, um, which also has a lot of uh, uh, venues, um, big ones and small ones, the museums. You have the natu Natural Museum. And beyond that, I think uh, right next to uh, the park, you have the Whitworth Museum. And you have a very good cafe there. So you have the university and the town, um, and then the museum right then and there. And so I think um, it's going to be possible for you to realize what you've just mentioned. Now, the Wanju Viennale, uh, you are the director and I actually was able to see uh, the Biennale. And w during my stay there, young, well, I think it was high school or junior high school students from the local school, probably, they came one after another. Maybe the school um, planned a um, school tr a trip, but I don't think I would see a lot of children or very young people at a Biennale or art festival here in Japan. Did that just happen this year because of the programming? Or uh, Guangzhou, of course, uh, is a place known for the democratic um, activism, democratic movement. And I think there were a lot of um, exhibitions related to that. So the Guangzhou Biennale, uh, for, for the town itself, or the city itself, is are the citizens uh, aware about the festival? Do they think that it is their um, festival? Yes, when it first started in 1995, uh, a lot of people in the art world in Korea thought Gwangju was a strange place to start such an international scale biennial. But... Um, I think the sort of the reason for it being there have sort of ha has two strands I think. One is the democratic uprising. Of course really tragic and still very relevant trauma the city had to endure. But especially uh, in the early 90s that was only beginning to sort of be understood and acknowledged as actual fact. Before then, it was actually understood as something didn't happen, and that sort of a historic acknowledgement was important start of that healing process. And for Gwangju, sort of thinking of art, visual art, biennial as a way of making themselves known to the world and sort of inter for the international acknowledgement, I think that's a very honorable thing, because um, when you think about Gwangju's history. It has always been known as a place for culture. It had a lot of uh, sort of legacies and sort of traditions of literature, but also visual art, craft, and other types of um, cultural sort of expertise. And sort of understanding the value of art and culture, I think that was based on that decision. And for the citizens of Gwangju, I think there are sort of ways of understanding sort of these young people coming and also just normal people, ordinary people who are not really knowledgeable about contemporary art also coming. They have some kind of a pride, but also um, seeing the biennial as their own resource. It's right there in their sort of their area and just uh, coming to see what's happening in that sort of uh, venue, I think it gives them some sort of a 
kind of pride, but also a connectedness, that sense of connection with the world. And um, another sort of um, thing I really appreciate doing Gwangju Biennale was um, this sort of curiosity and openness. Unlike like maybe in Western sort of context, contemporary art has a lot of people who follow, but also is quite limited to certain communities of the society. But um, in a place like South Korea and in a region like Gwangju, they are very interested in what's actually happening in contemporary art. And that openness, I think that's really what made Gwangju Biennial's history so successful. And I remember in the first Gwangju Biennial in 95 when I visited, there were like older people, young kids, everyone who may not really be seen in such sort of international venues were there and to see what is it. And that curiosity and openness, I think that could be something we can really encourage people um, to have. Just um, give it a chance before actually making that sort of prejudice or decisions about what it is. Thank you for that. So one more thing about the Guangzhou Biennale this year, I was interested in the how the Western star artists were hardly there. And we saw a lot of different artists from countries. Um, um, and the country, even if you hear the country name, you would not immediately be able to imagine where that country is on a map. Did you um, intentionally direct and select people from not so well-known countries? So my sort of training as curator at Tate Modern really equipped me to understand different parts of the world. And um, with really brilliant colleagues there, I learned huge amount of artistic practice happening somewhere other than like a Western Europe or North America. And because the theme was really about that very intangible and invisible power of art, they can very slowly change the sort of fundamentals in people's lives. I thought some sort of a sense of solidarity was necessary. And who else in the world would understand that kind of um, sort of trauma citizens of Gwangju experienced, and anyone with that history of repression will have a sense of resistance in them too. And I found those sort of shared sensibility of solidarity in many indigenous artists, but also less explored um, artists from what is called as Global South. So. I intentionally used their place of birth or activities rather than their countries because for some artists um, in a kind of colonized context, the country was or nation state may not be able to represent their real identity. So I would say born in Gwangju rather than South Korea or born in like... Um, particular place in Australia rather than the current Australia. So um, I think it was important for the artist to also feel that what they were doing in this very small specific place had some sort of resonances. So it wasn't isolated, but there are other people sort of experiencing similar things. So the, at the opening, uh, out of 79 artists, we had about 50 artists in pr presence. And they all sort of getting to know each other's sort of practice. That was really quite a beautiful moment. Now, thank you. Uh, moving on to Hashimoto-san next. So the Aichi Tree and Nale 2019. Um, it was quite a painful um, experience uh, looking, watching the development. So like the Guangzhou, um, Biennale, if Aichi and the people of Nagoya, uh, when we think about how the citizens uh, saw that situation, it's quite disencouraging. Um, but the Berlin Art Festival that you talked about, well, yes, it's quite 
um, complex for the Berliners um, among the many different programs. Uh, do they see it all as one a Berlin art festival? Well, I believe nobody understands it that way. Um, my job is to uh, explain what the Berlin Art Festival organization is all about. So in that sense, the art festival, uh, I think it, there's only a handful of people who really understand what, what it is, and the art director wants to change that. So that's um, in the background. And so you now have a unified logo. Uh, that in itself qu uh, changes the situation quite much. But the theme, is there an overall theme? Or are, are there no themes at all? Well, for each festival, there are themes. Um, that was so in the past and here today. But um, as the Berliner Festspiele, do we have one unified theme? Um, so far, no. Mm, along the line, while I'm serving in this position, I'm hoping that I can have one unified um, theme for everything. But in reality, um, you have the art festival, the v like the Biennale or Triennale. It's quite different from that, especially it's um, a for performing art mainly, and there aren't that many like that. So Berlin Biennale, I think I've seen something like that, which was quite radical. Um, it has a very social message, a very strong message. But the Berlin Biennale is quite is totally different. Yes, it's totally different. However, however, Gropius Bau uh, sometimes is used at, as the venue. Okay, I would like to pose some questions. So shift change was uh, the theme. But I'd like to ask both of you. So Hashimoto-san, I think you've explained um, in your pr presentation, but uh, Dr. Lee uh, from from so in the UK at, at Tate Modern, and then in Guangzhou, um, you are directing. And at Whitworth, also, you are a director. So you are moving into different locations. And so th you have different customs, different uh, traditions, different atmospheres. So as you change shift, maybe you faced difficulty. Or maybe um, it inspired your creativity. So I think it. There's a lot behind this, but what is your experience? I think inspiration is really the key. I find these specific places as very relative places and something related to the larger picture. And as I mean, the more specific, the better in some ways. And I want to really understand this different context really true to the place itself. And for instance, for the Whitworth, um, I'm learning quite a lot about Manchester's history and how complicated and complex it is. Because uh, Manchester was the really b birthplace of industrial revolution and also the place where, therefore, the place where the British Empire really sort of um, began to uh, accumulate huge wealth and Manchester's wealth and Manchester's rich kind of um, uh, upper class and middle class people really were about and related to the sort of colonial history of the British Empire. But rather than just thinking about the empire as one thing, um, it's really important to think about what kind of um, experience Manchester's real people actually had. Did they see those sort of, sort of wealth distributing to the sort of more wider kind of people? Or was there more exploitations by these workers? And th through the kind of the writings and studies 
like Engels did in Manchester. Engels' books are all about Manchester's working class labor, sort of workers, the factory workers and these people. And he saw the sort of capitalist exploitation at its kind of highest in Manchester. And I'm thinking, how can we make these very complicated histories more understandable, but also really acknowledging different sides of what looks like just one story. So, but it will have to be through art and artists too. I, I, I'm not really a social historian or activist, but I'm interested in how art and artists respond to these stories and how we actually reinterpret the history in the contemporary context. And I really trust the artist's sort of very unique perspectives about understanding these things and maybe propose something for the future. Thank you. So, Hashimoto-san, in your presentation, you did talk about this to a certain extent. And um, you went on a training program from the cultural agency to New York. And so you've tr um, changed locations quite a bit. In New York, I guess you did a lot of interviews and, and heard a lot from different people. So the theme of today is really um, different places and also funding. I think you did a lot of research into that. So what are your uh, you know, thoughts? Well, for 40 plus years, I've been living and working in Japan. And so, you know, I really felt that, wow, it's so tough to work as a foreigner in one place. If you were a local citizen, there are some things that you do not need to do. Um, but if you're a foreigner, you have to do certain things in order to build a foundation for your life there. Like you have to get registered at a foreign resident. And um, people who are born in that city um, would naturally be given some privileges that um, foreigners do not. And so after 40 plus years, this is the first time I uh, felt how hard it is to live as a minority in a society. And you know, and what I'm going to say is not directly related to art, but um, the one thing that left an impression on me when I was in the United States, um, we were still in the midst of the COVID pandemic. So there were a lot of PCR testing venues, and there were a lot of venues for vaccinations at pharmacies. And so people who are working there, when I saw them working in those venues, Most of those people say, um, do not say, um, I'm not the manager, I don't know anything. Well, they took more ownership. Like if the frontline workers do not do their part, then you're not going to be able to stop the pandemic. So they had a real sense of responsibility saying that who took them, made themselves responsible for proactively taking work. Uh, and that left a strong impression on me. And after that, as part of my research, I interviewed a lot of different people. And people who do fundraising. They say that you're not able to get funding if um, you know, you cannot say why you need that project. Motivation alone is not enough. Why um, you need to be able to explain why that project is necessary. What is the social necessity of that project? So, so you have to do things not as just one artist, but as a citizen. Why is this project necessary? Uh, you need to have this sense of responsibility and also a sense of mission. Uh, I think that's what I felt from the fundraisers. So my experience in the United States is, well, people say that individualism um, is what you see in the United States, but uh, 
actually uh, I found that people took ownership um, in what they are doing, and that's quite different from what I see um, here in Japan. So after the United States, you went to Berlin. Uh, Berlin, what's, what, you felt the difference? Well, Germany, yes. is a bit like Japan. People follow rules, so nobody would cross a, a red light, uh, cross the street on a red light. But what's different from Japan is people have opinions about why they don't cross the road when the right is led, when the traffic light is red. So they go back to principle. So uh, rather a cumbersome uh, kind of people, but um, as I s said earlier, um, a Christmas party, um, we had a 90-minute discussion just to decide how much uh, fee should uh, be paid by each individual who comes to the party. So people think logically, should I say, about these things, and so that was a big culture shock for me. Thank you. Now, so you get inspired by going to different places and and you I think you have a lot of collaboration um, in Berlin or in the UK um, in Guangzhou and Berlin and the Tate in London you have a lot of people working there from different countries. So the work that you do together, probably it may be tough at sometimes, but it's quite interesting um, and inspiring. So if you can um, talk about those two points, uh, first starting from you, uh, Lee Su Kyung Sang. First began to work at Tate, I was the first um, non-Western curator. So it was kind of a strange place. And when you think about other sort of fields were much more open, I guess contemporary art was a bit slow in that way. But uh, since then, I began to work with a lot of artists, I mean, the artists from across the world, of course, but also my colleagues in curatorial department and other parts of the museum um, began to be much more international. And uh, like uh, probably the languages spoken were also like quite numerous, and that really um, gave us a sense of much larger knowledge being shared. I think that's the really the great thing about having uh, international sort of working environment, and you get to know different cultures. When they come back from holidays, they will bring different sweets. And um, all these things really teach you about, you know, how people sort of live in these differences. But still, we are kind of together for one particular vision. And um, that that kind of uh, became a little weaker after Brexit, of course. And actually, European colleagues started to leave, and that was very sad. But um, again, I think um, we are in a, that sort of... Um, particular place in time to really test how these sort of nationalistic um, languages are going to affect people's um, understanding about the world. And art and culture, I, I think we are mostly quite liberal <laughs> in the ways we understand the, the world. So hopefully we can still keep our that internationalism that's not really about the sort of um, exploitation in the sort of that type of globalization, but again, more about the collaboration, connection, and real exchange. And I think that that would be the kind of nice thing about maybe a place like the UK, if, if we can actually keep that connection. <laughs> so with Brexit, um, did you see a decrease in the number of European um, colleagues? Um, did um, did Brexit have a Yeah, I think impact? it was about, um, yes, in short, <laughs> because uh, they, they felt a little rejected. And emotion is important when you decide. When you can live in other places, there is a choice. 
then when you feel one place hostile to you, there isn't really reason to live there because London's not the best place to live. It's very expensive, it's very like crowded. So when you have more options like that, and for people who can choose, I think it, there were definitely that moment of selection. But also for people who couldn't, obviously there are still huge sort of issues about Brexit when, when it becomes like everyday life things, like travels, but also sending goods like post and all these things, again having custom taxes and all these things. And um, movement for artists, that really became quite difficult too. So where people who can move around in UK are going to is they go to Europe, they go to Berlin, for example. And so people are free to travel, freelance artists and other people, IT workers, they all come over to the Europe. And so UK-based real estate developers are actually developing apartment complexes in Berlin, and that's really increasing the apartment prices up. And I, it was really hard for me to find an apartment to live in. So if I hear UK English spoken in, the, uh, in Berlin, I'm like, wow. <laughs> no, 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 that almost sounds like a joke. <laughs> uh, but anyway, after coming to Berlin, how, uh, how do I feel? Well, up until now, European performing arts festivals really had the theme of post-colonialism, and they had a lot of diverse expressions uh, showcased. And the image that I had that they were quite lenient and generous, but Becoming an insider, I feel that things are not that advanced. Expression itself, if it's something that the audience has never seen, yes, they are certainly open about showcasing them. But when you're actually working with them, there are some times where things go very smoothly. There are times when things do not go as smoothly. And in my earlier presentation, I talked about the production mechanism. In Europe, there's a very strong theater system that's established. They um, get involved in the production up to actually um, the premiere of the uh, work. So a work that's made through a different mechanism uh, because the production process is so different from what they are used to on a really specific scale, um, like the lighting and the uh, acoustics, and also um, what, how many hours to um, do for rehearsal, etc. Because the process that they are used to is so different, sometimes we are not able to um, see eye to eye about certain things. So what I feel uh, about my colleagues is that for a work that's um, created um, on a different mechanism that does not go as smoothly, they kind of seem to see that work as amateurish or not a real professional work. and. When I realized that, that's how I feel that people in Berlin uh, have pride in the European theater system, and at the same time, they think that something that's not produced in Berlin or Europe um, is still underdeveloped. And so in that sense, they have yet to reach true diversity. They're just still halfway there, because unconsciously they have this European-centric kind of a uh, perspective, uh, maybe unconsciously. And the other thing um, is in terms of content. And in my earlier presentation, I talked about the festival directors are uh, becoming more internationally mobile, uh, especially between European countries. Festival directors are traveling internationally and going to different festivals. What happens then is that many European countries have um, history of having um, colonies. And so each festival director um, under the theme of post-colonialism, um, um, reflecting back on the history, will be showing respect for the colonialized people and then showcase their works. 
for example, if it's um, a Portuguese uh, festival director, if he comes or she comes to uh, France, then um, you see more artists from colonial um, areas from um, France being showcased. The audiences in France may feel that's kind of fresh perspective, but that's like a double colonialism, almost like a zoo um, uh, showcasing people. That's kind of how it um, sort of seems to me. So in the performing arts area, um, the indigenous culture being presented, what tends to happen is, like I said, it's like uh, a zoo showcasing people. And the indigenous culture, the dance, uh, the songs, were not made to showcase to a big ob audience. It was done for their own community. So bringing it into a Western theater, it turns into a, a somewhat like an attraction in a tourist spot. And the European people, the audience, uh, will be watching it warmly, uh, like a tourist which is looking down upon the performers as something that's still immature, underdeveloped, which I think is a big um, is issue. It's, it's a very big problem. But no matter how much I try to explain this, people don't really understand. I believe uh, that's the tendency we see in Europe. So how can I... Punch them back is what I'm trying to figure out while while I'm staying here. Well, Hashimoto-san, in toward the end of your presentation, um, education. Uh, you talked about policy and the society. You've pointed out certain things. Festival Tokyo, uh, the Tokyo Performance uh, Festival. Uh, using multiple languages, and there was a program uh, concerning multiple ethnicities. Uh, but the th theme there, maybe, well, the people in the audience um, were ready to accept that, but maybe uh, may we, we might want to take it to elementary schools or to, to different venues. Maybe that... Uh, would be a good way to communicate. Or Akira Takayama, uh, people like that, uh, went out of the theater and took his activity elsewhere. So you might feel frustrated. Well, of course, not all artists can become like Takayama-san. Um, it's very difficult. And also... In another sense, it, uh, art education is carried out in Europe, so there is a good part of that, and the bad part um, is um, it's quite um, elitist. Um, it's exclusive, like uh, Dr. E said. But as I live in Europe, and what I'm really impressed is um, what I said to in my presentation, but the artists, art practitioners would go for a demonstration, they would go to vote if uh, they find something that's close to what they're thinking. So like Takayama-san, um, social practices and art could be linked together. Of course, not all people are like that. But, but then in order to express yourself, you can just go and vote uh, to, for somebody who has uh, similar thoughts like yourself. So... As I live in Berlin, um, against the social issue, I believe everybody is conscious and aware about that, and they are taking some sort of action in whatever way possible. Well, thank you. I think it was this year, maybe starting last year, um, Russian invasion into Ukraine. Um, this year, we now have uh, the attacks from Israel onto Palestine, and I would like to go back, come back to ask you about Berlin, but you see 
these big changes in politics and in society. And whether or not you take up the theme on Jewish uh, people, uh, there might be a lot of movements, a lot of struggle in, in the arts area as well. So last year to this year, we have seen a lot of developments in the political area, um, conflicts, wars. Maybe once again, what kind of attitude should you have towards them? I, I believe many artists are faced with that question. What is actually happening, or w what are your thoughts on that theme? Uh, starting with uh, Professor E, please. It's a really difficult but important question. And um, I, again, think it's, it's a personal choice when it comes to personal choice to gather around to do some sort of a protest also. <laughs> but still, it's a personal kind of um, view about these very difficult uh, issues. And the war is just um, very simply the worst thing that can happen to human civilization. And the attack on Ukraine was, in a way, simpler sort of thing for a lot of us, especially in Western Europe. It was understood and regarded as an attack to democratic sort of orders, an attack to the NATO, which is the sort of Western Europe and sort of North Atlantic, including the US, kind of defense mechanism. But when it comes to the Palestinian situation, it's, it's much more complex, because we do live with both um, communities in our own fields, and their views are extremely opposite, but both very valuable. And both sides really suffered huge amount of human um, sort of cost, and the violence on either side really cannot be um, justified. So at the Whitworth, we recently opened an exhibition called Material Power, Palestinian Embroidery, which was planned since 2019, so nothing to do with me, nor um, the current situation. But we had to actually consider many different views about this exhibition. So we had long discussions every week, and you can imagine probably Hashimoto-san, how to really um, understand, prepare the staff who may uh, face some abuse verbally or otherwise. And also people who come to see this exhibition from different perspectives. How do they actually feel about this um, situation like, uh, in, like ignited by this particular exhibition? So we had to be very careful in understanding many different perspectives about it, not just two, but also the sort of human perspective about these things. What is the emotional kind of connection to this situation? So when it comes to the political views, I think it's really personal. But again, we have to ex expect different views and respect as freedom of speech also. And without that type of understanding and um, acceptance, it will become really closed and non-communicative kind of thing. So as Sukyun san said, compared to Palestine, Ukraine has a much simpler structure. You know, last year when uh, I arrived in Europe, People in the German-speaking world, all the festivals and theaters were working together and saying that for Ukrainian artists who no longer have a venue to perform, they should be um, providing a venue. So there was this kind of an alliance going on. So that was one way of showing support. And that happened spontaneously. And of course, the German government also clearly said it would support Ukraine. So there was no major discussion about this. Um, people naturally provided support. But for the Palestine situation, it's really difficult for Germany 
they have the Holocaust history, so they do not want to be seen as anti-Semitism or anti-Israel. So for all political uh, persons and for people in the cultural world, um, making a comment that could be construed as anti-Israel is a problem for them. And you remember the documentary. And in Germany, theater directors and festival directors get a lot of social attention. And so when something major comes up, nationwide newspapers are going to be asking for comments. And so my um, boss, um, the artistic director of the Berliner Festspiele, was also asked by newspapers to uh, provide comments. And so how that comment should go out was discussed among all of the directors who were involved in the Berliner Festspiele organization. Um, checking with them, this, is, um, this comment is going to be seen as the attitude of the entire organization. Are we OK with that? And especially uh, the federal government, um, we are directly linked under the federal government. Therefore, the anti-Semitic comments, um, if we make them, it's going to be quite risky. However, when we look at the actual situation, we can't say 100% uh, we will be supporting Israel. Uh, nobody actually thinks that way. So how can we issue a statement? to show our consideration towards the Palestinian citizens. We had to really uh, choose the words we use. And every five, ma uh, five minutes or so, we were exchanging emails concerning what words should be used. So it was quite difficult and tough. As for an organization, um, showing solidarity towards Palestine may be difficult, but on an individu individual level, uh, some people may want to show uh, solidarity with Palestinian citizens. So they may go out for a demonstration. They may try to communicate through their individual SNS um, accounts. But in terms of artistic activity, or exhibition or performing arts, how do you express that? Uh, we are still struggling. One theater um, had some pro-Palestinian comments coming out, and they also um, had some artistic expressions like that. Maybe not because of that performance. Uh, they had to cancel that. And then, once again, there was this surprise asking that theater why the performance was cancelled. So whichever way you go, um, you see that things may flare up. And so we have to be really careful in our daily activities. Well, thank you very much, because this is still ongoing. Um, it's, it shows how difficult it is. Now, uh, I think we will be accepting questions, but um, we want to go through this questionnaire. And um, so anybody with a question from the audience? Well, then we'd like to move on into the Q&A session. If you have any questions, if you can please raise your hand. Anybody with a question, please? Well, thank you very much for the very interesting talk, presentations and talks. I have a question to Hashimoto-san. So fundraising, you have to exp in fundraising, you have to explain about the meaning of your work. But in Kyoto Experiment, um, yes, there were many experimental works um, in the festival. And People in Kyoto who are not really affiliated with art, uh, the Kyoto citizens, in even if it's not fundraising, is is it? Do you have any opportunities to explain about the meaning of this festival for Kyoto citizens, and how was that accepted? 
well, Kyoto Experiment, when I was still working for Kyoto Experiment, well, the arts um, agency and also I, we, we used um, private funds and we tried to explain about the social value of, of our work. So people who live in Kyoto, uh, we have been saying that we needed to appraise uh, or update the um, the art, uh, relevance of art. Uh, the population is 1.38 million or so, and about 10% would be um, university students, which is the highest um, in anywhere of Japan because there are 38 universities in Kyoto. Um, the number of universities is also very big, um, largest in Japan. And these people, once they uh, graduate, they would go to Osaka or Tokyo. Um, they do not stay in Kyoto. That's the reality. And that in itself um, will impact the tax income for Kyoto uh, because people who work, people who, uh, the um, labor force um, uh, population is quite low in Kyoto. And also, Kyoto is a cultural city. Um, that's the that's the basic principle. And you have a lot of tourists coming in. You have a lot of traditional Kyoto image um, to lure in the tourists. But the 10% or so young people, uh, the art activities that they um, enjoy is there as well. But you have a lot of resources going towards um, the artwork or uh, cultural work that attracts um, tourists. And um, because that is the only thing being done, you have a lot of um, condominiums being built up and that's uh, raising the tax uh, that has to be paid and that's why you have a lot of people not deciding to live in Kyoto. Um, young families would rather move outside of Kyoto and live in the vicinity. And that further decreases tax revenue for the Kyoto city. And it's actually accelerating the decrease in tax revenue. And so uh, people in Kyoto were very aware of that too. So in order to retain young people, people wanted Kyoto's real cultural identity, which is not just a traditional one. Um, when people saw the need to disseminate that information. And that's why we had the word experiment inside of the festival name, and that was uh, something that we repeatedly communicated. Also, um, Rome, um, which got the naming rights. Rome is a company um, that grew its business from semiconductors. And the um, Kyoto City um, Museum, um, Kyocera got the naming rights for that museum now. So there are many companies based out of Kyoto who have really cutting edge technology and science as their main business. And that's because in order to do research and development, they need um, really high level um, research. So Kyoto is a university city. And so it has high affinity with high tech companies. And that's why Kyocera and Rome still have their headquarters in Kyoto. So as an industry, um, there's a lot of experimental work going on. And that's the reality of Kyoto City, one aspect of Kyoto City. And so that's why, in addition to just the typical uh, traditional cultural identity, we need to showcase something else. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, the Kyoto Experiment has continued a lot of time. Okay, thank you. So how is that being received by people? Uh, it's a bit difficult. Um, and do you get an opportunity to hear feedback from citizens on what they think about that Kyoto experiment? Well, back when I was involved in Kyoto experiment, we solicited um, volunteers every year from citizens, and so they gave us feedback. And excluding those volunteers, for a dance a performance, um, you know, that um, the dancers strip naked, would people in general come to see that kind of a performance? Maybe not. And when you do festivals, this kind of thing happens um, every time. Um, like the um, transportation, 
uh, traffic and, and accommodation uh, facilities, hospitality industry people, and taxi drivers may, uh, maybe. Those people um, um, you know, say, hey, I know the name of the festival. And some people, um, well, the tough voices or the criticism will come from the volunteers. Uh, Lee san Hajimoto-san, thank you very much for a, a really inspiring talk. I'm Yoshimoto. I work for a, a private think tank I'm working on arts and culture. Uh, I'd like to ask you both. So European arts festivals and organizations inviting curators um, and staff from Asia, um, is that because European people are feeling uh, there's no future to a European-centric approach. Is that why they want a fresh approach from um, people outside of a, um, Europe? Also, Hashimoto-san, you said that the European theater mechanism is so established that they see everything outside of Europe as something inferior. And so I really do hope that you will make a um, you know um, breakthrough there. Um, but uh, could, if you could comment on those two points, that would be great. Yeah, I think it's uh, probably a combination of every uh, a lot of things, but definitely an interest and um, acknowledgement of different cultures and its their values probably help them to decide uh, on appointing someone. Uh, non-European, non-Western. And um, also there is a huge desire within these communities to really reflect actual people, the demographics of the society. It, for instance, Britain has a lot of people from like uh, South Asia, like um, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, but also some sort of Middle Eastern and Asian countries not as many, but quite a lot of them from there. And um, more in the sort of more African and other places um, across the world. Colonial histories usually tell where people are coming from also. It, it's where the colonies were very active, where people actually come back to the sort of main um, empire country. So it's about reflecting the demographics of the society, but also acknowledging the values of different cultures. But once that is sort of established and emerging as good standard, I think it's about, again, people who actually have that type of understanding too. Like your ethnic race, racial or sort of sexual identity doesn't really guarantee you being actually the the person who will um, value those things, but um, as as sort of a, as person, um, I guess you have to also really believe in those values that are becoming more important. For each art piece. Uh, um, probably making them more diverse, um, more diverse programming. Um, I think that's the strong desire that we see within the European um, art sector. But the operating organizations, people who think that there should be diversity there, uh, not many organizations think that way. So if I may say something cynical, uh, in order to guarantee the diversity of the programming, you want the connection in order to make that happen. Uh, that's, I think that's the stronger feeling um, within the organizations. So uh, organizations that hire people like me and also provide German language um, training, um, it's quite rare, but that is happening because of the 
current director who invited me. I, I've known him for about 12, 13 years. It's not just that he wants to introduce something from Asia. Uh, he already knew a lot of artwork from Asia. So it's not as if he wants to discover new things from Asia through me. Uh, but because of our acquaintance um, over the 12, 13 years, we shared a lot of um, basic thinking concerning art. So he probably wanted to have me in his circle so that we can discuss such matters. So because I'm in Berlin, it's not as if I can introduce uh, Japanese and Asian people um, freely. Uh, many people think that way, and they try to get me on the phone to get free advice. I hope that answers the question. Well, thank you very much. So looking at the situation here in Japan, I do hope that I can talk to you about uh, such things later when we, if we have time. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and the talk. Uh, Sukyon-san and Hashimoto-san, I have a question for each of you. Hashimoto-san, toward the end of your presentation, the, uh, the intellectual uh, capital that the society wants, maybe that's uh, the problem and you, maybe we need to make an overhaul of that. Uh, I believe you've pointed that out. And you lo looked at the city. So Tokyo and Seoul, if you compare the two cities, And last year to this year, Freeze Seoul, I went there. But over the year, the contemporary art in um, in a year, uh, I, I can see that it really changed, that it really grew and developed. Um, probably the public organizations, and it's not just the theaters, but the private sector also had great motivation towards art. Um, even if we consider COVID, I, I see that this development over the one year was really great. So I'd like to ask this question to Sukyon san um, South Korea, especially Seoul, um, why did contemporary art suddenly uh, become so popular? Um, was it because of the public approach uh, and or the private approach? If you uh, have any ideas about what kind of Probably approaches were taken. Probably in short, uh, both. But uh, I will elaborate a little bit more. In public sort of ways, there, there have been good supporting system from the government, but also um, different sort of city government and regional government to support uh, artists' practice by opening up artists' residences and making more public art museums. And um, obviously there have been huge sort of history of um, art education in Korea since the Korean War. Uh, there have been many art schools that educated very well balanced and technically really developed um, artists. And all those artists actually live in Seoul and a lot of people actually have residences and studios in Seoul as well, which is very different from say places like Hong Kong. You have a lot of like uh, private sector support, like commercial galleries and auction houses, but not many artists can actually live in Hong Kong, nor that many art schools producing these people. So I think the amount of artists and their qualities really determine that success in a way, really supporting the huge um, resource for good artistic practice to see and share and to acquire and market. Another thing is um, about sort of more um, the perspectives about internationalism. I feel that having worked in Korea and a little bit in Japan through Japan Pavilion, um, there is a still quite a difference within the sort of the value about the internationalism. Koreans are much more um, connected with that desire to be very internationally, sort of uh, 
be part of the huge international scene. I, I don't know why, but <laughs> as a Korean, I also had that sort of sense of part, big, big, uh, being a big part of that international art scene was a really quite a big vision for me. And I think that is shared with my fellow Korean uh, peers and artists and people working in public and private sectors. And I guess it's about also something about the sort of discontentment also, like Seoul and Korea is not enough for a lot of artists and sort of galleries working there. They want to have better things and sort of higher visions and these, these kind of desires that also drive them to be more connected and being open to these things. And um, in some ways, those things can be good um, sort of result of all these years of like undercurrent activities. So I, I see that as not really a sort of sudden success or sudden emergence as an international art scene, but something accumulated for the past 20, 30 years at least. Thank you very much. So next I'd like to ask Hashimoto-san um, about the way intellectual capital should be. You mentioned that in the Western world, especially in Europe, um, you know, um, people tend to um, see things outside of Europe as a kind of a human zoo and um, it's quite difficult um, to get them to really understand. But I'm sure that there are certain Western people, Caucasians, who will show a true understanding for those handful of people who really get it. Do you see any commonality, any common factor between those people who really understand? I, I don't know. Uh, but I think that person may have had experience living outside of Europe or may have experienced being a minority. Maybe that would make a difference. And in that sense, people, you know, who um, oh, you can really talk to, um, my boss is one such person. My boss used to be in Sao Paulo in Brazil. I, th How many years was it? I think he lived six years there. And he established his own produ production company and did work. And that's because he met a Brazilian woman um, in Berlin and he married her. And the power of love is huge. He studied Portuguese. He, he went to Sao Paulo, established his own company to do work. So he himself experienced what it's like to be a minority. And I think um, because of that, um, I, I'm okay talking to my boss. If someone has an experience of being a minority, then um, you can see eye to eye. And so I want to add one thing because it's quite interesting. In the world of performing arts, um, especially international, uh, internationalism, um, in Asia, which area is working on that? It's Taiwan. Um, they are always facing this risk of, in terms of diplomacy, and um, it's not called an embassy, but when you go to the Taiwanese embassy uh, sort of organization, they have culture for diplomatic activities. So performing arts, people in the world of performing arts, there is this great expectation. And since 10 years ago uh, or so, they, uh, Taiwan is sending a lot of artists to Europe and overseas. And they understand uh, or learn the theater mechanism um, in Europe, and they are trying to bring that back into Taiwan to develop the uh, mechanism there. So European festivals, if you go to European festivals, unfortunately, you uh, you see less uh, festival-related people from Japan, but there is an increase of the number of people going from Taiwan. And in terms of mechanism, in South Korea, you have the film festival uh, it developed quite early on, and then performing arts. Now Taiwan is rapidly developing. In Japan, uh, I think uh, the mechanism was established very well in whiskey. 
uh, because Europe, um, the United States, um, the Japanese-made whiskies are selling at very high prices. And the rich people are saying that the Japanese whiskies are very delicious. But the whiskey-making mechanism was established during the Meiji era. They learned about that, and they brought it in and developed it so that it matches Japan. And that's probably why Japanese whiskies are being appraised abroad. So internationalize and then going abroad, I believe you need to really work on the mechanism, the basic mechanism. Without that, just saying, oh, Japanese culture is wonderful, Tokyo culture is wonderful, and trying to export that, it's not going to work. Um, that's what I would like to um, tell the Tokyoites. Thank you very much. Well, yes, I think the time time is running out, but maybe we can take up one question. But we still have time from networking. Actually, there were seven questions coming in online, but maybe later on um, we can have people ask them directly to the panelists. So I think uh, we should wrap up this discussion session. Uh, Taipei Performing Arts Center. I think um, last year it opened officially, um, and actually it was a hot topic in the architect um, world as well, and the bis this big uh, f film theater. Um, the buildings are really great, but also the contents um, have been developed um, earlier. So I think Tokyo should uh, really start something as well. But I think I should hand the microphone over to the Secretariat. Well, thank you very much to the two speakers and also to the moderator. Thank you very much indeed.